sufficient break point. Okay, you are all going on mute. Welcome to the Caregivers Project uh, tells stories about caregiving during the time of confinement. I would say good afternoon, but as you already all know, we have people here who are on the west coast of the U.S. Well, not quite yet because Frank's late. He's in New Mexico and we have Europe represented. So we have people here from morning to evening. Most of us are on the east coast. Um, the Caregivers Project is a community of anyone interested in giving care to elders. So that includes elders themselves who may not need care, may have been a caregiver for their spouse, um, might be worried about needing care in the future. Those of us who are baby boomers should be very worried about our care receiving situation and we have something to do about it. We have something we can perhaps effectuate and that's one of the reasons we're doing this today. We sometimes have young people, um, maybe Lisa qualifies as a young person, um, who will be caregivers and we need to model for them the way that we all wanna be cared for because right now it's quite broken. Um, we also have the professionals who provide services and products to people who are caregivers and um, those of us in the senior care industrial complex who are trying to improve things want to speak about where that needs to go and there has to be a dialogue between the consumer and the business in order for this to go well. Um, so today we're going to read two stories then we're going to stop and I'm going to unmute if you guys have something to say. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, the title, some of us write under pseudonyms, nom de plumes, and some of us write under our real names. Um, and then we will ha we'll have a discussion after reading two stories. I also have to thank the three editors, uh, who was uh, David Flores, myself, and Shirley Wong, helped other people edit their pieces, and everyone um, had to make revisions. And they came back better and stronger and clearer, so... I'm glad we put the effort into that. Um, the first story is called Seventh Floor During the New York Pause by Sylvia Wu, who is in New York City. Hang on. I live in Washington Heights. I have some great neighbors on my floor. We make a good team and work well together without overstepping boundaries. We take turns inviting each other over for the winter holidays. We make sure to include a neighbor or two who is alone for the holidays or who has suffered a recent loss. All of us are in our 60s and 70s. Some of us have been caregivers for our parents. When my 96-year-old mother died many summers ago, one of my neighbors invited me over for Christmas dinner to make sure I wasn't alone. This was not a one-off. These invitations and cross invitations have been repeated over the years. Our tables always include a neighbor who might live alone or is recently widowed or elderly and afraid to go out alone at night. When the novel coronavirus struck New York City earlier this year, my neighbors seemed to know that we'd support each other and our community in small but meaningful ways. The neighbor who invited me for many Christmas dinners made a thousand cloth face masks for housing works to give to the homeless. She made some extra cloth masks for some of us and hung them on our doorknobs. Remember, this was when it was impossible to find disposable face masks in local shops and we were thinking about cutting up old t-shirts to tie around our faces. Then, one day, as I was walking past a tiny convenience store, I saw a disposable face mask tape on their display window. I went in and voila, they were selling them, two in a baggie at $4 a baggie. Pump bottles of Canadian non-purel hand sanitizer were for sale. A few rolls of toilet paper and Kleenex were in the back. I was ecstatic. This was the mother load. I bought enough masks to last a few weeks for myself and bought some of the other pandemic panic items in case my neighbors needed any of these near impossible to find items. Let me explain why I, why I was stockpiling for my neighbors. 
some of my seventh floor neighbors are in their 70s and do not shop at the local supermarkets here in Washington Heights. They shop online from Fresh Direct and Amazon Prime. Maybe it's because the nearest supermarket is five blocks away and they don't want to use a big shopping cart. Maybe they just can't find the products they want. More pertinent though, some of them have orthopedic issues that may discourage them from doing routine shopping or heavy items. In fact, a recurring topic at our holiday meals is how some of them had moved to the building to age in place. And so my pandemic care packages on the seventh floor began in mid-March. It started when one neighbor lamented that her fresh direct delivery did not include the toilet paper she had ordered and she was down to two rolls. I offered to give her some of mine or buy some on my next shopping trip. Since I offered to shop for her, she added that she had no hand sanitizer or bleach. As all of us know, by mid-March, no one could buy Purell hand sanitizer in the chain pharmacies. There was no bleach to be found. A week later, a different neighbor said the same thing about her fresh direct delivery. No toilet paper or paper towels. I heard the anxiety in her voice and said, I had some extra rolls of toilet paper. I asked if she wanted one of the extra bottles of hand sanitizer that I had picked up. She said, yes. And then I know where to buy vinyl gloves. I had half a box of vinyl gloves left over from my caregiver days and gave her some. I like seeing the smile of relief on her face. I'm not sure why I derive pleasure from helping some of my friends and neighbors. My feeling is if some of them are self-isolating during these months because they're afraid to get infected and their online order didn't include items they need, then why not help them if I can? I had been my parents' caregiver for 13 years and understood that kind of anxiety of being involuntarily housebound and needing certain things. I made sure my parents and I never ran out of rock bottom basics like toilet paper, canned foods, gallons of drinking water, and their meds. A few New York blackouts taught me to stockpile battery generated flashlights and lanterns for our apartment. Stockpiling had become a long running caregiving habit that stood me in good stead during the pandemic shutdown for myself and for my neighbors. Thank you. We're gonna go directly to Diana. Hello. Uh, my title is, How Not to Become Lost in Caregiving During a Pandemic. Caring for someone has the rewards and challenges. My name is Diana Flores Cachardi and I write from my experiences. I care for my mother, Milagros Flores, a proud 92-year-old, independent, strong-minded, devoted wife and mother who raised five children and six foster children. At one time, there were 12 of us living in a house with only one bathroom. She ran a loving and well-disciplined household where everyone had their chores. Her domain was the kitchen. She was very proud of her ability to cook meals for the masses. She cooked for the family, especially around the holidays, and was proud of how people were always complimenting her cooking. I admired my mother for the caregiver she was to my father when he became ill. He was on a very restrictive diet because of multiple health issues, and she applied herself to learning that diet and planning meals around it. Mom taught me what true caregiving was all about. She took care of him physically, emotionally, and lovingly. One of my many challenges that I find in providing care for mom is helping her to maintain a sense of independence, which is now severely hindered by her loss of vision, which happened late in life. In spite of her vision loss, she has a strong spirit, still striving to do as much as she can on her own. I find this is the area that requires the most patience on my part as a great part of my day is spent helping her achieve her goals on a daily basis. We live in a two family house. My husband and I live on one level and my mother lives by herself on the other level. As her vision has deteriorated, her anxiety and fear of being alone has also increased. A simple solution would be to have my mother spend a large part of her day with me. However, my mother has her own daily agenda and declines to spend her time in my apartment. 
This results in having to juggle my time between her household needs and mine. This time restraint also causes me to feel conflicted as I feel my own goals sometimes have to be put on hold. It also becomes difficult when you have to live your life in a block of time. My ability to get anything accomplished is dictated by the availability of the aid. We are fortunate that mom still has an aid for four hours during weekdays. But on weekends it tends to be the most challenging because there is no other support for her or myself. This is when I especially feel I'm losing myself in caregiving. The freedom to be spontaneous is lost. If the aid does not show up, then my plans for the day disappear. The pandemic added to that sense of loss because whatever family support system we had in place was no longer available. After the eight weeks of sheltering in place with no added support, my husband saw the toll the stress was taken on me and let me know that I need to communicate to my siblings and express my needs. The results were positive and two of my brothers each took one week shift sheltering in place with my mother. This gave me and my husband the respite that we needed in caring for mom. In order not to lose yourself in caregiving, I think it is also important to express your feelings and admit you can't do it all and not feel guilty about it. In caring for ourselves, we also become better caregivers. Okay, I am, I have unmuted you all except for those few who have themselves muted. And I actually wanna make the first comment about the two of those. Both stories had a, um, a concept of continuing caregiving or serial caregiving as I call it, people don't, like it when I call it the, your serial caregiver, but um, but it is true. We we modeled it. We we saw it as a child. We practice as an adult. Some people continue like Shirley did with neighbors, and we're inspired by having seen somebody having done it before. So both of your stories had that had that element in it that I find is so important, and, and that's why I want more and more younger people to get involved and listen to the things that we're saying. Um, especially the positive experiences that we're having. Does anyone else have comments for our, our writers? I do. Yes, yeah, Shirley. I really liked Diana's story. I, um, I really was able to relate. Not Thank with you. my neighbors. I mean, the neighbors I, I was, and still less and less so, shopping for are actually not that much older than I am, but they have issues. And they're, some of them are really scared of getting infected. I mean, like the, the looks on their faces, the few times I see them, um, and I have to hang, you know, the shopping bag on the doorknob, the whole thing and text them when I'm home. Okay, you know, um, but the exhaustion, the splitting of time, not having time that you can call your own week after week after week um battery 50 percent yeah i mean when i was caretaking to, my, my parents to yeah, I, I mean because you also have siblings and uh, at one point when my father broke his leg and my mother threw out her back my brother my older brother was actually living in the apartment with us because he he had to legally and he didn't help so, um, you know, there was no turn taking, there was no appealing to his better nature and the whole thing. Uh, maybe it was cultural, um, but somebody had to deal with all of the needs, the meds, the orthopedic issues, um, making sure the laundry was done. I, I really was able to relate to your story. Thank you. I also have to say having read everything before hearing everything is a very different experience to hear you speak it than it is to just read it on the paper. And I know sometimes it's hard to read, but um, you know, to hear someone read their own work is really powerful. Yeah. Does anyone else have comments on those two stories? I thought Diana was really just very frank about some of the trouble. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes I feel there's a lot of uh, maybe guilt attached to it, to really expressing how you feel when you really are exhausted and you just feel you need a break. It's almost like sometimes a feeling of guilt comes over you. And, um, but I think it's, we're human and we too need to take care of ourselves also. Can be all one-sided. Otherwise you burn yourself out. Mm. And it's not always easy to find somebody who's good giving, to give you a relief. But what I find with the pandemic now, the people we had who were helping are no longer available. So to be able to get that two week relief was a lot. And that's just temporary. But now we're looking into trying to establish some sort of method where we could get intermediate relief every once in a while. And we hope to see your brothers in two weeks. Yes, yes. And one of them was an outstanding writer. Yes. So um, I'm going to move on. Can I just say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, as, as the husband of the primary caregiver, it hurts me so much to see everything that Diana has to go through knowing that there are other family members who could be helping and don't. Now, I understand that the pandemic, you know, created a lot of um, anxiety about visiting mom, but after three or four weeks of not having the virus for them, not having the virus here, it was hard for me to understand how if they knew they didn't have it and we didn't have it, why they couldn't come over for an hour, for a day, to send some food, just do something. But it's just like there was absolutely nothing for eight weeks. And I saw my wife going through such stress yeah. from eight constant weeks that, you know, I finally, you know, How to get, I, involved. I get involved. And, and, you know, I try not to because I don't want to rub people the wrong way in the family. But at the same time, when I see my wife struggle, I have to do something. Mm -hmm. And he has been supportive, even though, and I, that's with Eddie uh, assisting me and providing support. It's still a struggle. When, and I think what makes it so difficult is the fact that mom is blind. And that's a big factor. Before, when she needed assistance and she had a vision, it wasn't so difficult. I was able to, you know, leave alone and, and manage and get some free time that way. But now because she has no vision and her anxiety of, of being in the dark increases, she, you know, she wants you there one-on-one -on -one as much as possible. As soon as the aide leaves, I have to run upstairs. So, you know, and, and it requires a lot of reassuring. And I know part of it is the fear and anxiety of, of, of being in the dark. And I don't blame her, but it, it, it takes its toll after a while. So, you know, we do the best we can. We do the best we can. Mm -hmm. okay. It's very complicated what you're describing. You're asked a lot, you do a lot. Yes. And you know, when, when your husband looks around at everybody else, their contribution may not be as great as yours. But each of us has the contribution we have to make. Exactly. And you have to be careful about the expectations mm -hmm. of others that they should yep. be as great as yours. And that's, that's yeah. really hard. So I know yeah. it's not easy. Mm -hmm. right. I can relate as well. And I know Frank just joined, my brother joined a little while ago. But uh, about the contribution from everybody. And I think it's something that, you know, when there's a large family or somebody where there's more than one person in a, in a family, it, it tends to have that kind of like that dynamic about who contributes and who doesn't mm -hmm. and uh, and it, it becomes a and it becomes a stressful and especially now in the in the in the mm -hmm. now you know with the pandemic and such mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna move on i'm turning you guys off okay this is um i am not a home health aide written by time and a half and time and a half is in New York City. I didn't train to be a home health aide and I don't have a certificate to work as one, but recently I did an eight hour shift because there was no one else. The job of a home health aide is simple yet complex. As far as prerequisite qualifications are concerned, unfortunately there are none that I know about. They enter a certificate training program bringing only their native intelligence, personal work ethic and quantity of empathy. The training is basic and includes some content on aging and disability. If I were to describe what a home health aide does, I would say they span the gap in activities of daily living between what the person whose home they work in can't do and what they need to get done. 
the tasks we all do for ourselves without intentional thought, such as bathing, grooming, dressing, eating, toileting, and taking medications would be on the list. After that, home health aides are primarily observers. They have to be observant for subtle changes and take that observation to someone who can contextualize the problem and find its solution. While not a requirement, home health aides should also possess qualities of patience and empathy. I was a caregiver for my mother who had Parkinson's disease. I was the night aide for several years. I didn't train to be a home health aide, but I worked with dozens of them and I have on the job experience. Annie doesn't need much. She's able to walk and just needs a reminder to use her walker, which she treats as an afterthought. She uses the bathroom by herself. She self-initiates a type of entertainment of watching out her 10th floor bedroom window to see how the people are now lining up six feet apart in front of the pharmacy whose door is in the plaza below. My, how the world has changed. People used to be able to walk into the pharmacy. Now they're queuing up to be allowed in. Let's see how long the line is at 10 a.m. and again at 2 p.m. And a final peek out the window to see if everyone in line has been served before closing at 5 p.m. Watching the world go by is something that the homebound do. Annie knows the world has changed. She knows that the president whose photo is pasted in her living room is not the current president. And she knows that the clippings of the male ballet stars taped in her kitchen cabinets are retired from the stage. She knows where her pills are and that she takes them in the morning and evening, but she loses track of what is morning and what is evening, therefore needing a reminder of when it's time to take them. The same is true for meals. Annie doesn't need hands-on care or spoon feeding. She just needs structure for common tasks that we all do automatically at the right time during the day. She needs the judgment of another person so that her misperception doesn't take her outside to the street or to the knobs on the gas stove. The day before my home visit, a home health aide called 911 because her employer told her to do so. The home health aide had reported to Alveda Care that Annie was coughing. I would like to take a long pause here and to ask you to consider if you were Annie, Annie's aide, or someone who cares about Annie's well-being, what you would expect a paramedic can do about a cough. Can a paramedic make a diagnosis? No, but all too often they offer an irrelevant opinion. Can a paramedic prescribe an antibiotic or cough syrup? No. It's a fact that a paramedic cannot evaluate a cough, nor can they effectuate a good state of health. Alveda Care, like many licensed home care agencies, operates with an implicit policy of box checking rather than goal achievement. This means when a home health aide whom they employ calls into a clerical or clinical supervisor with an important observation suggestive of illness, the procedure as happened the day before my home visit is to document that someone pressed the phone keypad nine, then one and one again. An observation of cough was made. Inexplicably, instructions were to seek a solution to a cough from the emergency response system. In the agency office, policies were adhered to, boxes were checked, asses felt unexposed, but nothing was resolved with the cough. The day before my home visit, I received a call from Annie's healthcare agent, who is not a family member, but a contemporary, someone born between the world wars. They went to grade school together. Imagine having a friend for over 80 years, a truly committed advocate. Then I called Annie, who told me she was, quote, fine, but I ordered a home x-ray anyway, because the context of cough right now is the prevalence of novel coronavirus. I knew Annie had viral pneumonia the evening before I saw her, because the x-ray report said so. I could see it myself in the image of her lungs. This disease is not a subtle thing. When I arrived for a home visit at 10.45 a.m. the next morning, the night home health aide was still in the apartment, but flustered and frustrated that she was late to arrive for her next sequ sequential day job because Annie's day home health aide was very, very late. She was fussing and fuming, but knew that she could not leave Annie alone. Home health aides who are in 24-hour care situations are taught that they cannot leave until a handoff to the next shift is done. Quote, never leave the client alone. This is part of their training and they do follow it because I suppose that leaving a client alone will result in instant job loss. On the other hand, a home health aide won't lose their job if nobody finds out that they work a night shift for one agency and a day shift for the next and so on throughout the week. The laws have made it such that in order to avoid overtime pay, 
the cost of which is passed on to the client. They just don't work overtime for any one employer, but add up overtime hours by working for multiple employers. The novel coronavirus has made it such that we need to stop and talk about that. I arrived for a home visit knowing Annie had viral pneumonia, and I met a home health aide who had been in the home regularly for weeks and for long 12-hour shifts. She was late to go care for another homebound elder who needed help with bathing, grooming, dressing, eating, toileting, and medications. I wanted to pin a button on her that said disease vector. So let's talk about that. When I was my mother's night aide, I worked overtime too. This was a choice and a necessity, just like it is for the home health aides I work with. The laws have been made such that certified home health aides can't get shift hours to add up to more than 40 hours per week without add up to 40 hours per week without going over 40 hours per week. And that causes an agency to have to pay and pass on overtime expenses just to create traditional shifts. They now have to work for multiple employers for up to 36 hours. Home care is not suitable to the framework of shift laws. Delivering home care is living in a dependent person's quotidian life. Caring for someone is a continuous job which does not fit with labor laws for construction workers sales staff, or anyone whose job has a productivity quota. The actual job tasks are intermittent. The purpose of home care workers is their presence, not their product. Annie had not been herself for just two days. She had a little cough, and she had been uninterested in dinner. She'd been laying down more and telling the home health aides that she was tired. Home health aides are supposed to describe what they see. Quote, she's not herself. Quote, she seems weak. They observed one instance of diarrhea, but Annie did not recall that. Quote, she didn't eat dinner last night. I wonder if Alvita Care tells their aides to call 911 when they get, get a report of didn't eat dinner. A very significant observation because loss of appetite is a symptom of novel coronavirus. The purpose of my home visit was to confirm how sick she was and determine if her medications needed to be adjusted or if I should be concerned about dehydration. Annie had fever high enough to warrant an antipyretic, but not the highest I had seen. To my relief, her oxygen saturation was normal. I called her healthcare agent and Alvita Care to communicate a diagnosis of probable coronavirus infection. As I was on the phone, the day home health aide walked in wearing a mask and gloves that she had on her hands when she pressed the buzzer in the lobby, opened the door, and pressed the elevator button marked 10. By definition, her gloves were invisibly filthy and the box of gloves in the home was nearly empty. On prompting, she removed her gloves, washed her hands, used Lysol wipes to frenetically and randomly wipe surfaces in the living room. After I explained that Annie had fever, cough, and viral pneumonia by x-ray, she called her employer and walked out of the apartment stating, I have asthma. I didn't train to be a home health aide, and I don't have a certificate to work as one, but I knew that I was not leaving the home of a 94-year-old woman who was sick today and on a good day, incapable of getting through the tasks we all do automatically. Alvita Care told me that the home health aide who walked out was a substitute. They had no one else to send to replace the replacement for today. They offered no solution to home care for today, but told me and Annie's health care agent that given the due diagnosis going forward, they were willing to continue to provide home care aides at a premium cost, a sort of hazard surcharge. The novel coronavirus is hazardous to home health aides, but it's not the same exposure as hospitals and nursing homes. I made a total of three calls to Alvita Care during my shift as a home health aide, and I had lots of time to do their math on their hazard rate for home care. Annie's health care agent was offered to pay for two 12-hour shifts per day of home health aides at a cost of $50 per hour compared to their usual $29 per hour. They would be doing the same job of preparing three meals a day, announcing it's time to take your pills twice per day, and being observers during the remainder of their shift. You see, home health aides don't work all day. They sit and make calls or send and respond to text messages. They sleep because most of them are on the job for 12 hours and another job for 12 hours. I know what you're thinking. How many of those 21 extra dollars per hour were going into the paycheck of the home health aide? who had to wash their hands, wear a mask, and disinfect surfaces. The executive director told me the home health aide's hourly weight rate would increase from $16.50 per hour to $25 per hour. Now that we've done the addition, let's do the subtraction. The home health aide is getting an extra $9.50 per hour, while Alvita Care is getting an extra $11.50 per hour. 
the executive director told me it was for administrative costs. You know, the cost of gloves, hand sanitizer and cab rides, so as to avoid picking up pathogens on public transportation. I didn't ask who was the beneficiary of the extra precautions. The grand total after multiplication comes out to $276 per day of gloves, hand sanitizers, and cab rides. For how long, you ask? I didn't ask that either. I'm a home visit physician. I am Annie's doctor. And part of the obligation of that role is to advocate and advise. It seemed to me that Alveda Care was perhaps trying not to take care of homebound who were infected with novel coronavirus. In March and April of 2020, that would be an impossible goal for a home care agency in New York City. Statistically, Annie cannot be their only client with novel coronavirus since I was making the diagnosis in homebound people in four boroughs of New York City. Novel coronavirus got into the homes of the homebound in the same way it entered nursing homes. It was carried there by people who give care to those who cannot care for themselves. The irony of the surcharge being deserved by the disease vector was not lost on me. I'm not a hope health aide, so I don't do what I have seen them do for the last three months, which is to walk into people's homes wearing gloves from the street, a mask on their chin, and treat their phone like it's a clean object. I consider my hands dirty and everything I touch contaminated at all times. There's only one place for the invisible pathogen and that is to wash it with soap down the drain. During my shift as a home health aide, I made Annie wash her hands several times after she put her hand over her mouth during a cough. I didn't take those actions to protect her, but she was now at risk to me and others if she touched the table, the light switch, and her walker. While the disease gets to the homebound from us, those who can't care for themselves also need direction on how not to pass it on. I didn't do much during my eight hour shift as a home health aide. I microwaved some leftovers and presented them to Annie for lunch. I found a dusty coffee table photo book about Annie's ancestral country, a place I have never been and will never travel to. We turned pages together as she struggled to tell me something of the landmark cities. Next, I found a beautiful photo book on Paris, a city we had both visited. When she said she would like to see Paris again, I honestly said it would be a long time before either of us could do that. Despite aphasia and with effort, she and I together read the French text. We did the best we could. Let me tell you who helped me end my eight hour shift as a home health aide. I called Nicole at Senior Helpers. Nicole went to the home of Annie's healthcare agent to sign the home care contract. I can only imagine the number of calls she made to home health aides who might wanna show up for a new job right now. At 6 p.m., Nicole came to Annie's apartment to meet the new home health aide, and I was able to hand off care to someone who, after greeting us, said, where can I wash my hands? It was a long day, and I had completed many tasks. I made a frightening diagnosis without really telling the patient how scared we were for her. I fired a home care agency. I got a new home care agency hired. I read two books, tried to speak French, and used the microwave. I saw the worst and best of home care all in one eight-hour shift. It's now a month later and Annie is truly better. She is one of the lucky ones who never got sicker than she was that day. I am not a home health aide. I am a home visit physician. We're going to move on to We Are In This Together by Nicole McGuire, who is in New York City somewhere. Nicole is unmuted already. Go ahead, Nicole. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've been a part of the Senior Helpers team for seven wonderful years, and my role within the agency is um, Vice President of Operations. So just to give you a little bit of background, we are a licensed home care agency, and um, I work very closely with everyone on the team and especially um, the president and owner of the agency, Kathy Livingston. Um, the caregivers of who I speak of in this story, they come from all walks of life, different backgrounds, nationalities, and speak many different languages. Um, these caregivers take care of our clients and take care of their own families. The caregivers have never questioned um, if they were essential workers, they showed up to their clients' homes with a positive attitude during a pandemic and consistently took the initiative to ensure that they were safe and that everyone they cared for remained healthy. 
the caregivers possess so much great qualities and we would have would have had a lot more challenges if it were not for their strength love dedication and compassion i am proud of our team and our caregivers are more than just employees they are our lifeline and family we all heard about the coronavirus in February, but really did not start to feel the effects or understand how serious of a virus it really is until the beginning of March. Before COVID, my team leader, Kathy, and I talked every day about the safety and well-being of each employee and client of ours. In March, our conversations were focused on personal protect protective equipment, infection prevention and control policies, and how we as a team could protect our caregivers from being exposed to the virus as much as humanly possible. During the week of March 9th, we started to check in with each of our caregivers daily to see how they are feeling, how their client is feeling, and to ensure that no one has symptoms of COVID. We continuously went over infection prevention and control policies, hand washing, social distancing, keeping six feet apart when possible, and clean and disinfect all surfaces and objects every day. My team and I deliver masks and gloves weekly to our caregivers as it is our duty to look out for every caregiver that is on the front lines to make sure they are supported and safe. My leader, Kathy, and her family started to sew washable fabric masks for all employees to wear to use for traveling or as an added protection while providing care to clients. It was not until the week of March 16th that I started to realize that most of our caregivers' feedback on the coronavirus was not of fear, but knowing that we are in this together. I have heard from several caregivers that they are not afraid of the virus as they have committed themselves to taking care of people who are vulnerable and sick with all different types of diseases or conditions. Their main concern is making sure that their client is healthy, feeling safe, and loved. All the caregivers love the fact that we check in with them every day, love the washable masks, and the support that is provided to them each day. During a time of isolation and fear, it feels good to know that we are connecting and helping a special group of caregivers that are always helping others. Caregivers all over the world are my superheroes. They are brave, selfless, loving, and perseverant. We would not have been able to get through this without these individuals. With all the negativity going on in the world, I would like to shine the spotlight onto the positivity that caregivers bring to the world daily. I want all the care caregivers around the world to know that you are loved, you are cared for, and you are appreciated more than words can say. I have unmuted you all except those who self-muted and we're open for discussion. Nicole had, Nicole had no, uh, had not, actually all of these were written independently, even the ones that pair well together. So she had no idea what my story was about. No. <laughs> I think it's an important point that you mentioned about caregivers. Being in this situation, I find that having my mother's caregiver is very reliable, very caring, and very loving. And having someone in the household you can depend on to help you makes such a world of difference. Even the time that she's here just gives me enough breathing space where I could get things accomplished. You know, not everything, but at least it's a breathing space. So it, that's so crucial. Yeah, I'd like to add, she actually showed up today on her day off just to spend some time with mommy. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, yeah. And she actually brought a dessert. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask those of you who work in home care, and there's a handful of you here, how do we get people like that, and how do we filter out, I mean, before they even get in the system, those who shouldn't be doing this type of work? Is there a way to do that? I think it has to be by feedback. If you're getting yeah. clients that have complaints and, and this, let's say, caregiver has multiple complaints in the household, it's mm -hmm. really up to the agency to follow through mm -hmm. and really, you know, do, do their part in weeding them out. But okay, well, then the next question is, many agencies don't want to do that because right. 
a warm body is dollars in their pocket as opposed to quality of care. I think some agencies are in it for the business of, you know, yes. like this, getting an extra eleven dollars and fifty cents mm -hmm. an hour on a mm -hmm. excuse. Maybe there should be a grading system or fine system, whereby fines are issued. So we have it, the government does that, but the government doesn't care about the same things we care about. Right. And, you know, we could, we could set up our own um, Yelp and Google reviews, but the, the amount of effort it takes to do that to make sure you're not just getting a disgruntled person or somebody who doesn't have right. a it would have to be experience. I think it would have to be more than one complaint on the same person, but I think the agency should be held accountable. And I think the only way to get them to change is if you affect the money yep. coming in and find out the only way, some way of impacting on the reimbursement. That's, I feel that's the only way, really. Yeah. Are there procedures in place for the agency to regularly check in with the clients uh, to get that feedback actively? Or do they, mm -hmm. do, Nicole, your agency, do you um, wait to see if you get complaints or do you? kind of monitor the situation from well, a managerial standpoint? Sure, so the way that we, I mean, there's no like specific guidelines for each agency. This is, each agency kind of handles it on their own, but how we do it is we actually check in like after, so we have, so whenever there's a new caregiver and it's especially the start of care where somebody from the office is going out to introduce the caregiver, um, and then also make sure that, that it's a good fit and a good connection. Then we check in, you know, during the shift and then after the shift, just to make sure that everything went well, then we, you know, let the caregiver and the client adjust to one another and, you know, really get to know. And then we're checking in at least after the first week, then two weeks in, and then we also do monthly check-ins as well. So, um, you just try to stay on top of it. Like you said, I think the best way of, uh, you know, finding good caregivers and, you know, weaving out the ones that are, you know, just in it just to be in it is really just to stay connected and, you know, talk with them and figure out with the families also what's happening. Because there are families that aren't as vocal about issues that are going on either because they're afraid. They don't want to say anything or, you um, you know, they're just want to keep it as is because they think that it's working out, but they're still like feeling a little weary about it. So I think mm -hmm. just providing encouragement and support and just checking in all the time is really the only way to kind of make it go smoothly. It's also a good time to talk about birds. You want to explain birds? Sure. So um, what we do is, um, well, when the caregivers come for interviews, we have them do an assessment um, personality. It's not really a test, but it, it kind of asks different questions to figure out what kind of personality they are. And we have, we base it off of um, four different birds, which is the eagle, peacock, dove, and owl. Um, so an eagle is somebody that likes to be like consistently in control. Um, a dove is, you know, somebody that's, you know, non-confrontational, you know, more peaceful. A peacock is somebody who's, you know, very talkative and, um, an, an owl is somebody that's very inquisitive, needs to know information, not necessarily, you know, like relationship building. So, um, we also, when we go out and, assess clients or, you know, talk with them over the phone, we're also trying to figure out, you know, what their personality is, um, you know, who they are as a person. And then that's how we really try to connect the caregivers, you know, with the clients just to make sure, you know, that it's a good match because that's, because that's important. And it goes to very special, special person to do what you're doing and uh, I have great admiration for it. And, um, yeah, but it's very hard to find people who are selfless, truly, truly caring people um, and there for their clients. So. One of the things I find when I treat some of my patients is that I let them know that the home health aides that come to their home, it's their home. And if for any reason there's any sort of conflict in personalities or so on, they're not obligated to keep that person in their home. Is their right? Because some of them will say things like, oh, I don't want them to lose their job, or they're afraid, or right. 
and at times I've had to make phone calls myself to get the aid out of the house and not have them ever set foot in the house again. Um, where a case, I had one case where the, the husband was dying of cancer uh, and the wife was overwhelmed. And when I walked into the home, uh, the wife is in the bedroom doing basic uh, bathing to the husband who was bed bound. And there's someone sleeping on a sofa. So I thought it was a family member. And she goes, no, ah. that's, that's the aide. I said, what? And she never had an aide in the home before. She didn't know what the responsibility. She didn't know how to supervise the aide. So sometimes part of the job is to teach the client how to supervise the aides and tell them what their rights are. Right. And so on. Or sometimes call the agency directly and give them feedback as to what's going on in the home. So that's another way. Is there a couple quick questions for you? One, what's your cat's name? Erin. Erin, little movie star. We got to get a cameo from from that. <laughs> yes. Doug, did you? Have a second? Well, uh, I, my question is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, is there an, uh, an advocacy group that I, I know you are, but but you're you're limited in your uh, uh, over uh, your over your reach and how far? And I have a suspicion there's going to be a number of things change because of the coronavirus. Not. A suspicion. We know very well there's going to be a lot of things change, and it would seem that if there's legislation transitioning in terms of what the hospital should be preparing, and and I won't even try and make the list, but but that this is an issue in our culture that's much much bigger than anybody seems to realize. And I'm I guess my question is: Are you aware of of uh, advocacy, uh, whether it's a group or an agency or? A team bigger than yourselves that actually would have some impact on the people that are that are um, manipulating that legislation. I, I'll make a comment. Of, so you know, we've been today so far. We've only spoke about one type of home care, and I think what Diana was referring to was a different type of home care. So there's some different classifications of it depending on who's paying for it. Therefore, mm -hmm. different who's regulating it. So that if you, if you lump it all together, those of us on the inside know what a certified home health agency is and what a licensed home health agency is and what a Medicaid vendor agency is, or, or even what a, um, I forgot what they're called when they're just, they're just referrals. They don't, they're not the employer, but they have a list of people who are vetted. So it's, it's a huge range of mess. Um, and it simply got that way based on who's paying for the services. So an uh, advocacy agency who was smart enough could classify all of those, have a website where we had some sort of comparative information and had verified clients give feedback, but then it's all connected to state law. So, it, I mean, that's my comment. I mean, Nicole has a, a different viewpoint on that, but it would be a huge undertaking. Um, and do, does the government really care about the consumer level not in my opinion no well, it's like all of the health care and we're all hoping that it evolves yeah. and i'm just hoping that this sector that you're focused on is is well represented in that evolution yeah nicole did you want to comment on advocacy group or oversight organization yeah um i mean you know, in regards to like av advocacy or, or oversight, I mean, I know, you know, that we, like our agency specifically, like it's, it's all private pay. So, you know, we're, you know, really, you know, in there, like consistently, I mean, now it's harder with everything that's been going on. I mean, we have been doing like televisits. So, our director has been, you know, doing like Zoom calls with the caregivers and the clients and we starting to do like a little bit of like telenurse visits and also in-person visits. So we're still, you know, trying to find that balance, but like we really do try, you know, to advocate, you know, for the families and, um, you know, pro to, you know, and let them know of information that's out there that can help them and that can, you know, provide more support um, if needed. Um, but it's hard because, again, it's just recommendations that we're making. Again, it's up to the family, 
you know, whether they choose to, um, you know, take advantage of some of the support that's provided or not. And some families don't, you know, really want to, you know, have so much involvement. They just want to know that everything's okay and that everything's good to go. So, I mean, it, it just all depends, but we just try to provide, you know, as much support as we can. So Nicole, I think Doug's question was, are you aware of any kind of watchdog organization that would come oh. you to your competitors? Oh, sorry. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any. It seems we could be optimistic in, in some sense. Uh, certain things have evolved over time. We have maternity, paid maternity leave and things that weren't even uh, able to be considered a, a, a generation ago. And, and this is a subject that, that uh, I don't hear in, the, in political discourse. And it, maybe it should be. Maybe there sh it should be on that list of things that uh, we, sh we should be looking to our politicians to be paying attention to so there is some, some more guidance, if uh, oversight or, or regulation that would uh, um, help to, to uh, support what you're hoping will happen in this, in this community. I can see the, the, the frustration, or maybe that's an overstatement, but the kind of strain that, that's put on your work, but on, on your patients and, mm -hmm. and, and, and on your clients, and I, I'm not sure that the, the goodwill of the conversation will reach far enough. And I'm sort of asking the question, if, if, should we be talking about what's that next step that, that brings other players into the conversation? I'm not sure how that would be done. That's not my, right. my specialty by any means. But it, it's, it seems like that would be an effective um, a place to be looking for, for help on this. On this. Have you guys seen a big difference in the level of care from home health aides when people do or don't have a GCM involved? Um, it depends, again, it depends on, on honestly how involved like a family, like if family members are involved in care or not. So, Sometimes, you know, with GCMs, there is, um, you know, there's a lot of where they want to, you know, obviously be full in control of the care and, you know, want to be able to communicate to the caregivers without, you know, actually having to communicate with the office because they want to have that constant communication. So there is, so if the families live far or they're not as involved in the care, there is definitely a benefit to having, you know, a GCM in place. Um, you know, sometimes even when the families are, you know, located nearby and, but again, can't be as involved in the care uh, because they're either working or they have their, you know, their own lives going on. Um, you know, even having a GCM, um, you know, is helpful, but, uh, you know, even families that live nearby, but you know, are spending all the time, you know, with their families or, you know, caring for their family members in addition to the care that we're providing. Um, you know, sometimes it goes good with the geriatric care manager, sometimes it doesn't. It kind of depends on situate, you know, every situation's different and family and family involvement, I think, is like the key to that. I see that uh, Frank was joined by a special guest in the video. I yes. was wondering whether we could say hello. Hi, how are you doing? Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Is my mom with you? Huh? Yes, my mom. mom with you? Hi, Hi. mom. Yes. Nice to meet you. <laughs> we were late. Uh, I'm sorry about that because, you know, to be truthful, you know, we were trying to get into Zoom. <laughs> but it took us a while, you know, because this is like one of the first times that I got in, involved with Zoom. But uh, um, I, it was very interesting what I was hearing. Um, I had to take over the job of taking care of my mom because the the wonderful lady that she had before for personal reasons, and also they didn't they the company they that is providing the service for my mom they couldn't find somebody you know to suitable for my mom. And also, I think the coronavirus had a lot to do with it because it happened at the same time. 
this started. And, um, and also, I don't want somebody to come inside my mom's house because what I've seen so far doing this job, I, I work in music and I work in music production, but I had to take over the job because we don't have no one else to do it. So um, they told, they pay me uh, $9 an hour. I'm here in New Mexico, on the border of New Mexico, which is very low. But I took it anyways because I do it anyways. Um, I will do it for I will do it for nothing. I did it for nothing for seven years, so it's no problem. But it, it's a, a really a mess the way they deal with it. I mean, um, the information they give me, all the pages are faded. I can't read anything. Um, uh, the the check when it comes in. Um, it's usually short in the hours, and when you complain, you know, it's a, oh, you know, it's a, it's a little short. It's five hours short, six hours short, and they said, oh yeah, we'll, 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 we'll you know, we'll work it out. We'll, you know, and then you don't hear again from them, and you have to. So I figured that the people that are working for the company, um, they're very unhappy. They leave. They don't care. And like I heard somebody saying, then the some people were sleeping in the couch, couch watching TV. It's true. I see people smoking and talking on the phone all morning mm -hmm. while the lady inside the house, you know, is alone in there. And I've seen this happen. I'm taking the trash from my mom's neighbors, you know, in the, in the city or complex. I take the trash. And the other day, the, the caretaker was there with the lady smoking and talking and all the trash was around. So I think she was expecting me to take it. And I said, are you going to take care of this? And she, and she looked like this and she said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'll, I'll do it. You know, and, and it's her job to do this. So this is the kind of people that they're hiring because the company's not acting properly. You know, they're, they're very careless too. So that's what I, I experienced, you know, in, in doing the job. But there it. seems to be a reluctance for people to actually tell these stories. I mean, I had to choose to name names. I, I have dozens of other stories of things like that that endangered people's health. And I do think we need to publish them. And we need, we just need those little short snippets of things that we see. Because to get back to what Doug said, I don't think the politicians know that the government is paying for these services, which are not services. So that we can't advocate they change something until we document how broken it is. So I, I think that's the next step. I'm going to go on to um, our next section, which is a poem followed by two stories. Um, so we're not going to pause for the poem because that's an artistic thing that's different. We can discuss uh, Dana's poem when we discuss the two final stories. So I'm going to mute everyone again. Sorry, my dog just started barking, of oh, course. Right. And we have a poem um, called I Live With My Mother by Dana Marchetti, who is in Kingston, New York. Of course, as soon as I need to read, the dog starts barking. <laughs> An ant must have farted, and he heard it. <laughs> um, I live with my mother, and let me tell you, all that we've experienced and what we've been through. There's always a crisis in the house, even with a pandemic outside. There's tension, enjoyment, worry, and love that are all constant and flow like the tide. I live with my mother for the first time in a while. I feel like in her eyes, no matter what age, I'll always be a child. Doting, suggesting, reminding, and questioning the thought of my independence to her must be wild. I try to remind myself that I'm lucky and blessed to be able to see her daily throughout, the, throughout this whole mess and confide in her when I am down or stressed. With all the anxiety of wanting her to be safe and well as we are cooped up inside giving each other hell comes hugs, laughter, and stories of new memories to tell. I live with my mother and I'm sure by now there's been tears because the thought of my love for her still does that even when we're confined together and she grinds my gears. And now the time for us to part nears. When I find, while I find both peace and sadness and knowing it's not forever, I wouldn't trade a thing 
or the moments we've had together. I live with my mother. I like the rhymes. It's a poem, Peter. Thank you. I'm, we're going to, our next story is um, Listening in Trying Times by Hans Wolf Guzman, who is in New York City. By the way, for, uh, for those that you know, Frank Wolf is my brother, and that's my mom. Beside uh, him, she was uh, in one of the chair, uh, it was uh, my mother's recipe, I believe, what, three years ago mm -hmm. that she, she joined us, and she's joining us today. So uh, good to have her, good to have her on board. So here we go. So listen in trying times. Listen. I believe that listening, this is one quality that I've been able to um, handle. Start, with. start over. We didn't hear the beginning. The story is called Listen in Trying Times. Your mic, your mic is having some problems. Okay. Um, yeah, we can't, we, you get cut off. Now we can't hear you at all. How about now? Good. Better. We're good? Okay. Yeah. So listen in trying times. Listening. I believe that listening, this is one quality that I've been able to handle with a certain degree of expertise throughout my life. I am what they call a good listener. Now more than ever, listening has become a valuable tool for those who take care of loved ones. When I say those, I specifically referring to my brother Frank. As with many family and friends who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and had to stay in place, communication, especially or specifically telecommunication, has become a lifeline to remind us that everyone is still there and we appreciate more of their presence on this earth and in our lives. With my brother Frank, telecommunication has been the main instrument for him to check that I am safe during this time because I live in the state hit the hardest. Our conversations are more meaningful, are more meaningful. In reality, I'm not sure if in the near future I'll be able to board a plane and spend a few days in New Mexico or if Frank can travel to New York. Besides checking in on me, Telecommunication has become the tool for Frank to talk about being the primary caretaker for my mom and the tool for me to practice my listening skills. It has become the avenue to celebrate the good moments, decompress about the bad ones, and cope with the role of caretaking in trying times. When New York pause went into effect on Sunday, March 22nd, New Mexico was business as usual. In fact, in New York, I was living in a crisis zone and in New Mexico, Frank was going on with life as usual. Frank's reality was completely different. In New Mexico, specifically Alamo Gordo, city where my mother and Frank live, was playing a very slow game of catch up. No one was wearing a mask or protective equipment. Frank had to deal with meals on wheel personnel who were coming into houses with no gloves, no masks, and putting both themselves and everyone they served at risk. All the while, as Frank was trying to do the right thing, seeing how New York was that canary in the coal mine and that there was a very likely chance that we were well, that what we were experiencing could happen in New Mexico, he had to deal with resistance. Resistance from supermarket clerks who coughed on food items that he was buying to cook for my mom. Resistance from neighbors believing this is all a deep state conspiracy. I listened. I heard that Frank had an uphill battle. He was devoted to be there for our mom. He was devoted to taking care of the person who brought us into this world and more than ever, protect her from this crisis. For me, Frank is an essential worker. And for him, I will answer that special FaceTime ringtone and listen in trying times. Beautiful, Hans. Frank, our finale. Uh, the, the final story today is The Power of Love in Turbulent Times by Frank Wolf, who is in New Mexico. Thank you. Hello. Well, the title is The Power of Love During Turbulent Times. Hello, my name is Frank Wolf. I'm 58 years old, and I take care of my 87-year-old mother, Ruthita. My mother was diagnosed five years ago with vascular dementia. 
which is a general term describing problems with reasoning, planning, judgment, memory, and other thought processes caused by brain damage from impaired blood flow to the brain. We live in the town of Alamogordo, New Mexico. Since the coronavirus pandemic started in January 2020, our lives became very difficult and I had to devote my life to help and protect my mother from being infected with this dangerous virus. She forgets that we are going through a pandemic and all the precautions that we need to take to stay safe. Because of her condition, she cannot assimilate what we're facing today with coronavirus and the danger that, re that represents to someone of her age. My mother receives meals on wheels during weekdays, and even though the management and the chefs are very caring, we had cases where the delivery drivers came without wearing masks or gloves. Sometimes I've heard them coughing, which made me very concerned. I was concerned to the point that I called Meals on Wheels and explained my concerns and fears to the directors. It took them a while to pick up, pick up and understand the dangers of the coronavirus in this town. But now they have most delivery drivers wearing masks and gloves. Still, I have to be at her home 10 a.m. ready to receive the food tray with a mask and gloves on. I have to wash all the containers with soap and warm water and reheat at high temperature all the food coming from any outside sources. My mother had a housekeeper who had to leave for personal reasons. The company that provided the service for us couldn't find another suitable person for my mom's needs, so I had to take over the job. I take care of her apartment. I clean the kitchen and bathroom every day, vacuum the carpets, prepare some of the food, and I set up the table and serve lunch for both of us at noon every day. My mother will not eat if I don't eat with her. I hear her childhood stories about 50 to 100 times a week, or perhaps a lot more. I always act like it's the first time I'm hearing it. It's amazing how she can remember so much from her childhood. Full poems and, sto and stories and even prayers in Latin from her time at her Immaculate Conception Catholic Nun School. I take her on a car ride around the town almost every day. Since almost everything is close in town, it's the best I can do. I notice that she begins to get depressed and sometimes a little hostile or hostile when she doesn't go out at least every other day. So I had to put my job, which is a record production, music production, and my life in pause for as long as it takes to make sure Rutita is safe and remains well. She did it for me and my three brothers when we were kids, and I'm happy to be able to do it for her today. I'm thankful for the support and all the help that I get from my wife, Anita, and my brother, Hans, or this will be much, much harder for me. I guess that's a real power of love when we're going through turbulent times. Thank you. Beautiful, Frank. Thank you, thank you so much. It's you know what occurred to me is, um, I, and I guess this goes ranges from Doug's saying, how are we gonna change this with advocacy? And, and well, what is motivating us right now, or what's motivating many people to follow the rules is the love that we have for our elders. Because yeah. if we only, if we didn't, if we only had ourselves, perhaps we are more careless and would be more careless. But I, I hear our politicians saying, do it for your seniors. And, um, and that's, and everything you do is with that in mind. and, and from there, you're protecting the rest of your family. Yeah. So our, our, our elders are something that motivates us to do the right thing. Yeah, I totally agree. And I see a lot of people alone. And my mom, my, my mom lives in a complex that is beautiful. And it's, uh, she has a beautiful apartment. And it's, it's like a senior complex, but uh, instead of 
like being like a senior center or a senior complex where everybody's together in, in one building. They all they all have their own apartment and, and they're really nice. I mean, they're really kept and they're, they're beautiful. And it's beautiful kept. But uh, I see people there, the, they have children, they have kids, but they're completely alone. They were left out by their kids. And it's really sad to see them, you know, what they go through. I mean, you know, they have to go shopping or, or they have to be calling for help, calling for people to come and help them in every way. They don't have nobody to take the trash out sometimes, you know, stuff like that, or to change the bag, the trash bag, you know, sometimes they can't do it. And I have to do it. So now I can't go inside their apartments, but I'm getting more and more and more involved, with, you know, with the people that have, they're not my family, you know, that they're not part of my family. So, so because I cannot see somebody being, you know, I mean, filthy in a beautiful place, but it's, you know, they have to the trash there for days, you know I mean? So, um, I'm getting more involved and, and it's, I, 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 it's, it's really tough to see. Here things are not as, as um, I mean, when I was talking about the company, I think Nicole was talking that she, she works for this company, but mm -hmm. here's completely different, you know? People are not uh, as caring, you know, as they are in other states. I mean, here it's like, it's a money-making thing. And, and now they're just picking up with the coronavirus to try and be, you know, like I was saying, you know, they gave me all the, the stuff to read when I started working. Everything is faded. You couldn't see a thing. And that's the pages. Some of them are blank, blank. And so, so you know, I wonder, I wonder why people do a bad job. It's because they don't get paid enough. They don't, they're not treated well. So. That's kind of sad, you know, that we have to go through that. They, 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 the older have to go through that, you know. You're, you're not, you're not uh, on, your mic's not on. The mic is not on? Um, no, yours is fine, but the hands oh, is okay. not Okay, I'm a, I had it on me. Sorry. It's all right. No, so I was just saying that, um, as you know, I was talking about the FaceTime story that, you know, here we were going through the crisis and it was a very serious crisis. And just listening how how there was like almost I, like a carelessness, right? Coming from from New Mexico and what had Frank had to deal with this. And, you know, us talking and telling him what I'm, what I was and how we were in this, uh, you know, in a New York pause and how the everything was happening here and the escalation that everything was rising and over there was like oh you know uh you know it's it, it's not that bad and like you said it's like finally they started catching on and now they're they, they they're doing the the proper thing but it, it's just amazing to see and then to go back to what we were talking about government how everything is there's there's so much like miss there's that like miscommunication in all the 50 states about what this is and how it's affecting you know it's affecting our loved ones yeah we're not acting like a country we're acting like different countries in different states mm -hmm. that the people are going out here you know people go out and the guy coughed on me uh, and hurt it right on my face right and i told him i said you kidding me? <laughs> and, and we're, he, we're edging he, into like from the flu you know and, and stuff that are just ridiculous. They come up with comments like that that are infuriating, you know, because uh, they can kill you or they can kill their parents, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, people here, the, the, a lot of people here, they follow, you know, the, I don't know, they follow the, the news. I mean, whatever they, they hear, oh, I don't have to wear a mask because they say, you know, you don't have to wear a mask. You know, so I'm not going to wear a mask, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and but now, now they're they're catching on. All right, right? people are wearing a mask in, at the market. You know, I mean, we're seeing, but a lot of people are walking around like it's a. Like Frank, a, let me jump in. Um, I, don't, I don't think you should feel that that New, New Mexico is is a, a special case. I think it's a, across the board, across the world, that half of the population, uh, largely, I'm going to say undereducated and we can look at our education system for that but they're not understanding the consequences and and uh, New York got pushed into it because of, a, of the epicenter and the way it landed here but I wouldn't say that morally we're generally much different it's happening all across the board happening I look out my window here and I see people playing basketball and I'm going I'm sorry that's not acceptable 
people. So we're, just, we're right. it's happening all across the, the country. And you're not you're not caught in a, in a microcosm that's in trouble. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, and the message that we're getting from the leader of this country, you know, what I mean, uh, my pants. I mean, and they're not wearing a mask. They're going to a hospital and not wearing a mask. I mean, and, and that's a message that people are getting, you know, from from Mike Pence and Donald Trump, and 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 and, uh, and that is to me, it's like, it's you see everybody around them with a mask, you know, and then they're not wearing a mask. So people are getting this message: Oh, the president's not wearing a mask, so I'm not going to wear a mask. I don't have to. He said I don't have to. Well, he's mm -hmm. part of that. Part, he's part of that half that's un undereducated that I was talking yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I have a, question, yeah. for, I have a well, question for people. Like, uh, I'm sorry. Um, this goes to back to the the, the uh, advocacy aspect, and you have something in the hospital systems. I think called the Patients' Bill of Rights. Uh, I see it posted when I get when I have uh, uh, when I go for whatever. And I'm wondering if within this uh, uh, elder care community, if there is anything that you can use that that is widely distributed that says. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this with this person so they know what their rights are. They know they don't have to put up with this nonsense or they can call a certain agency or something like that. Is there, is there, a, is there a kind of a general statement that you can share with uh, universally? So that's a, we probably should write something like, draft something like that with the input of multiple outside organizations, I'm sure there's a little bit of something that Nicole has to give out that says, if we do something really bad, you can report us to the state. Mm -hmm. But what, what Doug is suggesting is the more subtle differences that people have brought up, like you're, you should expect that your home health aide is not sleeping on their shift unless their shift is overnight and they're supposed to be sleeping. So for the common man, Maybe we should draft something like that. That would be a really good idea. And I think we have the people that we know we would put on a 10 person committee to actually do something like that and take that to the government and or take, give it to good agencies who say, we have agreed to abide by this. We have agreed to, to meet this standard of care and therefore you raise the bar for the agencies who are below. So maybe that, that's, thank you, Doug. I think that's a great idea. We're gonna, we have to wrap up. I, I just wanna go back to our, our poetess and say that um, Dana's uh, rhyming was exquisite and, um, yeah. and there is something lovely about getting to live with your mother. We've got two people living with their mother and um, that's a, it's a wonderful thing many of us Oh, there's three of you. I'm sorry, Diana. <laughs> I, want to say something. I want to say that when I read the, all the, my, my, my paper, you know, uh, my mom, she, she uh, used to speak English very well and understood English. She doesn't anymore. She went back to Castilian, you know, which is like Spanish from Spain. But that's what she understands, speaks now. So when I read some of those things, you know, I couldn't read those things, you know, I, I knew she was understanding some of it. So I didn't want to sound cold, you know, reading all those things, you know, but actually she can't understand that, you know, some of the stuff because um, um, we, don't t we don't talk about, you know, the condition at all, you know, with her. Very little, you know. They say, no, she needs to know, but, you know, it's just better that I, I found out, you know, that it's better that I don't talk about it, you know. Just in case she has anything. So we're, we're going to end. I want to remind everybody that we're going to do this again on June 6th. Um, I think I, I have several people who are promising to do more writing. Um, Peter was given a suggestion. And if anybody else wants to do a different angle on anything, if anybody knows anyone to invite, if you just want to come back and listen, that would be great. This is whatever recording we're doing now will be posted somewhere and you will be notified of that. On our website, all of these essays and poems are somewhere. Um, you probably wouldn't be, probably wouldn't know where to go to find them, but, um, but they are there and they're on Facebook. And uh, once this video goes somewhere, I hope people who are not shy on social media will comment on how their experience went so we can get the feedback in that way for the public. Um, anything that you didn't get to say or you want someone to hear again in writing. Um, 
And I want to thank everybody for coming. For coming. This was a, a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Nice. Take care, you, everyone. Everybody. Be safe. You, you got it. You too. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.